around the world. The Spirit is moving and a voice is being heard. Welcome to The Voice of Evangelism with David Langford. You can write to The Voice of Evangelism at P.O. Box 502, Kayser, North Carolina, 28020. We'll give you that address again at the close of today's broadcast. But here now is David Langford. Hello, friends. This is Pastor David Langford. It's Monday, November the 4th, 2019. We'd like to welcome each of you today to this edition of The Voice of Evangelism International Ministries. We just trust and we pray as always that something will be said, something might be done that would encourage you and strengthen you and give you a greater impetus to seek the Lord and to follow in his righteousness. Amen. I'm excited about the great things that God is doing. I do want to encourage you to register for our revival meeting April the 16th through the 19th, 2020 at the Hickory Metro Convention Center in Hickory, North Carolina. The theme for that conference will be Power Failure in the Church. Power Failure in the Church. And regretfully, the church as we presently know it is failing the populace. It is failing the people because preachers are unwilling to preach uncompromisingly. I shared a message with you some weeks ago uh, on YouTube, how shall they hear without a preacher from Romans chapter 10, verse 14. Again, and how shall they hear without a preacher? Because we don't have preachers preaching the Bible today People can't hear, people cannot know, neither can they discover the biblical truths that God wants to impart unto them because there's a failure on the part of preachers preaching the word of Almighty God. Amen. We've been speaking about repentance and repenting. We talked about the depravity of man. We spoke concerning that salvation is of the Lord, simply meaning that no man has any part in his redemption other than to believe. To think otherwise is to think in error and to think wrongly. To think in opposition to what God has done for mankind. Salvation belongeth unto the Lord and not men. And so for the last several programs, we've been addressing the subject of repenting and repentance. And we talked about how there's such a profuse failure in the pulpits from the purported preachers who will not preach the message of repentance. Friend, the message of repentance is the greatest message that has ever been heralded or proclaimed ever. Repenting, reconciling, getting right with God. We talked about the psalmist David and how that David backslid. David drifted. David wafted away from God and he fell into adultery. Had Uriah murdered and continued to go on in his life as though nothing had ever happened relative to sin and him sinning. The danger with that is no man has any divine assurance that God will continue to deal with him about his or her sins. Genesis chapter 6, verse 3, my spirit will not always strive with man. Now, we know that God unctionized Nathan, the prophet of God. He went to the psalmist David. He indicted David regarding his sins. And, of course, when David was indicted terribly, profusely hammered with the guilt of murder, the guilt of adultery, 
his first response to God was in that August prayer in Psalms 51, verse 11. He said, cast me not away from thy presence. Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Don't leave me in my sin. Deliver me. Salvation belongeth unto the Lord. Psalms 3 8. Deliver me from my wretchedness. Deliver me from my sinfulness. Deliver me from my wickedness. Get me out of this cesspool of sin. You see, when, when men do not repent, they are literally dead men walking. You've heard that phrase to prisoners who are on death row. The phrase is dead man walking. When that jailer comes to the jail cell, many times they bring a minister with them and they give them their last rites. And then they unlock the door and they walk down the corridor, the hallway to the execution chamber. It used to be an electric chair, gas chamber, chemically induced death. But the term is dead man walking. Though they're walking, they are dead. Though you are walking, you may be on the job today. You may be sitting at your desk. You may be turning wrenches. You may be running a skill saw. I don't know what you do. You may be driving a truck. I don't know what you do for a living. But if you are living a life of sin, you are a dead man walking. Death is certain. The wages of sin is death. Romans 6, 23. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. The wages of sin is death. Don't ever think sin will reward you gratuitously. No, sir. Sin pays terribly. The wages of sin is death. You say, but oh, she's such a beautiful woman. Oh, he's such a handsome man. Oh, this job is so great. Oh, this and this and this. No, 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 no. The wages of sin is death. Death. David fell into sin. Thus his plea, his cry was gut-wrenching because of this adulterous act with Bathsheba and the murdering of Uriah. Thus he said, cast me not away from thy presence. Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Don't take the true eternal life that only you possess, God. Don't take that gift of eternal life from me. Please. He was literally a dead man walking. And so God, in his great love, sent the prophet of God, Nathan, to indict the man of God concerning his sin. Repentance simply means to ask God for the forgiveness of sins, whatever the sin might be. Now, there are grievous sins, like adultery, like murder. There are sins of cursing, sins of drunkenness, sins of lying. Sin is sin. And no matter what kind of sin that it might be, Sin must be dealt with, and God has paid sin's debt by his blood at Calvary. Revelation 1, 5, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Ephesians 1 and 7, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sin according to the riches of his grace. It is the blood that cleanses us from sin. Now, the cleansing the atoning or the atonement has already been provided. But you have to provide 
the element of repentance. You have to be the person who says, God, I know I'm wrong. I know I have sinned. I am convicted of my sins. Thus, I want to repent and confess my sin and show remorse and show contrition, and demonstrate humility, and say, God, I repent of the evil that I have done. I I would say 99% of the time that I go to pray, I always ask God to forgive me of any sin that I may have unknowingly committed. I may have said something. I may have done something. I may have behaved in a a manner that was not Christian. Uh, I may have uh, acted rude or or whatever the case might be. I, I just want that element of divine protection on my life. The Bible said in Ecclesiastes chapter 7 verse 20, there is not a just man upon the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. Not a just man. In other words, nobody's justified in themselves. No matter what you do, you cannot justify yourself. You cannot justify your sin. Now, you may try to justify yourself. You may try to justify your sin, but you have to be the one to confess and repent you are guilty of sin. Now, I know you're not going to hear your nominal so-called preacher Preach repentance today because they want you to feel good. They don't want you to feel bad. I'm not here to make you feel good. I'm not here to make you like me. I'm not here to get you to embrace my disposition, my presentation, my personality, the the personage that I am. That's not my job. My job is to preach and teach the Word of God, and the Holy Spirit and the Word of God will reprove you. He will rebuke you. He will exhort you. He will bring to your life whatever the need might be. Why? So that you can be right with God. Man. Man and his sin separates him from God. It's not your education or your lack of one. It's not your last name. It's not your your your, your level of education in the world. It's not your physical stature, whether you're six feet six or you're five foot eight. None of those things. Whether you're Asian, Russian, uh, American, Chinese, that has nothing to do with anything. It's sin in our lives that needs to be confessed so it can be forgiven. It can be forgiven. You cannot be forgiven of unconfessed sin. If you've done something wrong, you've done someone wrong, you have to go to that person and repent and ask to be forgiven so that you can be reconciled and the relationship not ruined and utterly destroyed. Not utterly ruined and utterly destroyed. This is the problem in America, in the church today. People ignore their sin. They just go on as though nothing happened. That's exactly what David did. He murdered uh, Joab, excuse me, Uriah. He had Joab put him to the front of the line in the heat of the battle, had the other soldiers to pull back so he would be killed, and it looked like the enemy was the one who had him killed or killed him. They did kill him, but it was David who had him killed. It was David who committed adultery with Bathsheba. It's therefore David's responsibility to repent of his sins. God's made what we call atonement for sin, but man has to confess his sin. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sin, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Notice the word, if we confess our sin. 
Are you confessing your sin? When you sin, when you miss the mark, when you grieve the Holy Spirit of God, do you repent and say, God, I'm sorry for my sin? Or do you go on and ignore it? I've never failed to be amazed at how in my personal life, it may be two weeks, it may be three weeks after I said or done something, and the Spirit of God deal with me about that sin. Now, that's not a sin to separate me unto death from God, but nevertheless, it is a sin that has grieved the Holy Spirit. And God says, I'm bringing that to your mind. I'm recalling that event so you can confess it and make it right. If you died without making that right, would you go to hell? I don't believe you'd go to hell. It may hinder your rewards. It may hinder your place, position, posture in the kingdom. Why? Because it's not right. Now, John talked about there's a sin unto death and a sin not unto death. I want to be careful here so that I do not mislead you into thinking, well, there are different things relative to sin. And, 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 and so one sin's not as bad as another sin. There is truth in that. There is truth in that. But there is truth also in the fact that some sins are not sins that separate us from God to the degree that it is death, a sin of death. Let me share that with you from 1 John chapter 5, beginning at verse 16. If any man see his brother sin a sin which is not unto death, he shall ask and he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. There is a sin unto death. I do not say that he shall pray for it. All unrighteousness is sin, and there is a sin not unto death. Now, let me help you here. All sin is unrighteousness. All sin is unrighteousness. But not all sin is a sin unto death. Into the context, into the way, the means that God amputates you and cuts you off from him. I'm not trying to confuse you. I hope I'm not. But I can tell you a sin unto death is a sin of fornication, sin of adultery, uh, uh, sin of uh, murder, drunkenness. What about my attitude? It's ugly. That's not a sin unto death, but it's still a sin. What about that curse word I said the other day? I wouldn't say that's a sin unto death, but it's still unrighteousness. That's why we're told in Ephesians 4, 29, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edify, that it might minister grace to the hearer and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed until that day of redemption. Let our bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, evil speaking be put away from you with all malice, be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Now let's look at some of those sins I just quoted there. Let all bitterness, that's a sin. Is it a sin unto death? I would say, no, it's not a sin unto death, unto damnation, but it is still evil. It is still sin. John says it very plainly. 1 John 5, 17, all unrighteousness is sin, and there is a sin not unto death. Now, look at verse 18. 1 John 5, 18, we know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not, but he that is begotten of God keepeth himself, and that wicked one toucheth him not. Now, when he says, but he is begotten of God, he's born again. Because he's born again, John says, he sinneth not. Now, what that means there is he doesn't live a life of sin. Before I was born again, I lived a life of sin. But I backslid as a teenager. I went back into open sin. I, I, I went into open sin. Gross sins, terrible sins. 
I'm ashamed of my sins. I'm ashamed of my past. It was degraded. It was debased. It was a life of debauchery. It was a life of wickedness. I had to make that right with God. Now as a Christian, I do not live a life of sin. Yet, the propensity, the proclivity exists in my loins, in my personage, that I still can sin, but I don't live a life of sin. This is why I grapple so with the once saved, always saved, false doctrine. All unconfessed sin is that it's unconfessed and it is held on your account. All unrighteousness is sin. It's wrong. I, I, I talk to a lot of people I People share a lot of things with me. And people say things. They do things. And they live a particular way. They live a particular lifestyle. I know in my heart it is wrong. My God, the church is being inundated with sodomy. I told Steve years ago, this is the great sign of the coming of the Lord. Sodomy. Sin. That is a sin unto death. It is, it is an abomination unto God. Adultery is sin, but it's not a perversion in the context of its abnormality. It's not abnormal in the context of human behavior. It is a sin, though. It is a grievous sin, but it's not the same as sodomy. That's an abomination. It is normal for uh, two straight people, a man and a woman, to have a normal relationship. But outside of wedlock, it is evil. It is sin. It is wrong. When you're married, it's amazing. There's nothing wrong. It, it's just not wrong. When you're not married, it is a sin, and it is a sin unto death. How do I know some sins are sins unto death? I'm going to show you right here. Paul makes it clear. You see, Preachers are failing you and not telling you truth. They don't study the word. They don't pray. They don't fast. They don't seek God for a divine word. Know ye not, 1 Corinthians 6, 9, know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Shall not inherit the kingdom of God. It could be said, shall not inherit eternal life in Christ. What are those sins? Fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, effeminate abusers of themselves with mankind, thieves, covetous, drunkards, revilers, extortioners, shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Those sins right there would be described as sins unto death and separation from God. You say, well, I got mad the other day and a curse word slipped out. I would say that's not a sin unto death because it doesn't bring that up there in that passage, does it? But here's the problem. Those kind of sins ultimately lead you to other sins which literally grieves the Holy Spirit of God and people begin to say and people begin to do things and they live another way. Now, let's go on. Let's go to Galatians chapter 5, beginning at verse 19. Now, the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, Fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness. What is what is lasciviousness? It, it, it is a somebody who has absolutely no control of their 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 lives. Lust, greed, uh, adultery, fornication, uh, homosexuality. There's no there's no restraint of any kind on their lives. Idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, hatred. You say, well, is that a sin unto death? Yes. 1 John 3.15, he that hateth his brother is a murderer, and ye know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. That is a sin unto death. Why? John says there's no eternal life abiding in him because he's a murderer. Cain was a murderer. He hated Abel. He killed Abel. Sin unto death. Galatians 5.20, Idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, 
emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, they that do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. So again, Paul gives a litany of sins here in Galatians 5. This says if you commit these sins, you're not going to inherit eternal life. That tells you they are sins unto death. Sin that separates you from God. What about that bad thought I had? That's not a sin unto death. That's a fiery dart from hell that your shield of faith did not quench. Ephesians 6. Why? That's why Paul talks about putting on the whole armor of God, having the shield of faith to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. In my mind's eye, I always visualize old uh, uh, 18th century covered wagons and, and Indians shooting torched arrows at them and catching them on fire and burning them up. Satan shoots the fiery dart in your mind. And that thought is absurd. That thought is vile. That thought is vulgar. You say, how can a Christian have such thoughts? You're always held captive to your humanity. You're always held captive to your humanity. You can't help the fiery dart. You can't help the thought, but you can help in not reacting to that thought. Just like David standing on the balcony, looking over, and he sees this woman bathing. He sees this woman bathing. And the devil shot the fiery dart from hell and said, you'd, you'd like to sleep with that woman. And that spirit of lust, that spirit of greed, that spirit of covetousness of another man's wife said into his heart. Now, God didn't do this. The devil did this. James chapter 1, verse 13, let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust. And when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Now, we don't understand, many times we don't understand the gravity, the magnitude of what committing that one sin may ultimately bring in our lives relative to repercussions. We, we just may never see that. Now, David never saw Amnon raping Tamar. David never saw Absalom leading a rebellion against him to take him down and him usurp the Davidic throne and kingdom of David. You see, the devil never shows you all of the peripheral damage, collateral damage. When David committed adultery with Bathsheba, he never thought he would have to have her husband murdered. The devil never lets you see the ultimate, ultimate consequences of the sin. Let me tell you something. As a young man, and having been licensed with the Church of God out of Cleveland, Tennessee, as a young single man, as a young single preacher traveling as an itinerary evangelist, I would look at my license hanging on the wall and I'd say, son, to myself, I'd say, David, if you mess up, you lose those lessons you've ruined, you've destroyed your life and your ministry. I always kept that in the forefront of my thought. Why? That was a deterrent. Because you never know when you sin. It's like throwing the pebble in the pond. 
You never know how far reaching the repercussions of that sin may be. I always, you've seen these young kids, women, young women, young guys, and the orange jumpsuit in the courtroom, and the judge is about to sentence them for the DUI that they had and they killed somebody, whether it's manslaughter or they accidentally shot somebody and killed them. They're always crying and they're uh, feigning remorse and sorrow and brokenness. But see, the devil never shows you all of that previously. He never shows you that prior to it ever happening. He doesn't show you that damage. Oh, he just shows you the glitz and the glitter and the beauty of sin. Man, this is great. Man, if I could have that man, oh, if, I, if I could just have that handsome, debonair, distinguished, well-defined, well-groomed man who's got a great job and makes great money, if I could just have that man in my life. And then the devil sows the seed and the plot begins. The manipulation begins. Again, let no man say when he's tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust, and when lust hath conceived. You see, sin is a type of conception. Something is birth. Something is born. Now you've got to deal with what you've birthed. Lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Now that you have brought forth, you have conceived this evil that you committed, now you've birthed something. And what you birth now must be dealt with. I don't want to deal with it, so I'll abort it. I'll abort it. Yes, I shacked up. Yes, I fornicated. And I got pregnant. But I'll just kill it. And that's the end of it. Not necessarily so. Now, because of that one sin of fornication has led to another sin of abortion and it may now cripple and mar your female organs to the degree you can't have a baby. Now, the devil's not going to show you all of this or a body part of that child is left in your body. And it deteriorates and rots and something leads to something else and you become septic and just, just all sorts of mess. You, you think the devil shows you that? When lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. Sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. So now we're committing sins that are sins unto death, meaning these certain sins now separate us from God eternally. Now I know, regretfully, somebody's going to get confused and say, Pastor Lankford is preaching or teaching this and that. It's error, heresy, whatever. But you have to understand what I'm saying. Paul gives us defined sins and says, you do this sin, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. If the sin, which it will, if it is sin, what's going to happen in your life is this, conviction and guilt. That's what's going to happen. If you told a lie, the Holy Spirit will strike, he will smite your heart profusely, you will feel guilty and say, I've got to get this right. I've got to go to this person. I've got to straighten this out. I can't leave this unchecked. It'll rot. It'll fester. It'll come up a, a, a terrible boil, a terrible sore in this relationship and, and ultimately destroy it. Well, that's what happens between us and God. You don't deal with it. You leave the sin unchecked. Let me quote it again. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sin, 
he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Anything that is grievous or sinful, it is unrighteousness. Again, 1 John 5, 17, all unrighteousness is sin. You've heard me say this, righteousness. What is righteousness? Righteousness is doing the right thing. Righteousness is doing the right thing. Anytime I, you, anyone that are blood-bought, born-again children of God do something wrong, the Spirit of God in our lives will say that's not right. Now, if you don't care, you'll just sweep it under the rug and go on act like nothing ever happened. Well, David tried to sweep adultery and murder under the rug and God in his mercy, God in his great grace said, I'm not going to let that be swept, swept under the rug. I'm going to deal with your sin. David understood his lack of repentance because he said, oh God, do not take thy Holy Spirit from me. Cast me not away from thy presence. Please don't do that. You see, he understood he was just a hair from being terminated from the kingdom of God. Just, just that close to sealing his doom. And because he had to be indicted, because he had to have it brought to his own conscience and light, God says, because of that, David, the sword will never depart from your house. David realized his sin now encroached his entire family and they would suffer. And there would be, quote unquote, dysfunctionality in all of their lives. You want to talk about a dysfunctional home? Well, the psalmist had one. His own son, Amnon wants to rape, and he did, his own sister, Tamar. Absalom leads a rebellion against him. Joab kills Absalom. Ahithophel helped, he was one of David's greatest counselors. He helped foster the rebellion against David through Absalom. And then when Ahithophel realized what he had done, he goes home, he gets his house in order, and he hangs himself. I mean, folks, this, this, this stuff just keeps going on and on and on and on and on. That's what's wrong with America. We, we, we've got so much sin and so much sinning, leaders sinning, leaders lying, leaders swindling, cheating, embezzling, whatever the case might be, these are leaders of chaos, and they produce greater chaos in America. This is why we're this is why we're so rotten as a nation. We are rotten. We are a rotten, stinking nation. Our leaders. I would tell them all: You're rotten. You're a stinking leader. You're 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 worthless. You're worthless. You lie. You cheat. You, 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 you have hatred in your heart toward this president. You'll do everything you can to destroy. That's the sign that your father is the devil. He kills, he steals, he destroys. These low-life politicians work for us, but they treat us as though they are the tyrants and the despots, and we're subjects. We're nothing but ants. We're nothing but cockroaches. We're nothing but worms to these people. Why? They are leaders of sin, filth, and degradation. They don't. They lie in a heartbeat. I'll never forget it. You've heard me say it. Adrian Rogers, God bless his soul, dead, gone now, one of the great Baptist preachers of all time. Adrian Rogers, he said, no man is more like the devil than when he lies. the president of these United States in my lifetime, Bill Clinton, put that bony finger in the face of that camera and said, I did not have sex with that woman. Just like daring you to question his truthfulness, his 
veracity, his validity, his authenticity, daring you to question that. That's what sinners do. They, they, they double down, they lie. And they double down on the lie. Why? They want to make you doubt the veracity. I know they're liars. You know they're liars. And yet they'll turn around next week and say, I'm a Christian. I pray for our president, but he's broken his commitment and vow and oath to the Constitution. Every stinking one of you have broken it in some capacity because the one congressman stood at the speaker's desk and said, we all have broken all the rules in the, 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 the quorum here in the congressional chamber. He said, we all do it. The black pastor, I think, from Mississippi or Missouri, I forget which state he was from. My God, we don't realize how wicked and sinful we are. And this is the reason, this is the reason it is so demanding that we preach repentance. I can hear the preachers now, but I don't want, my congregation to feel bad when they leave. Okay, let them feel good and go straight to hell. That's what you're saying. Let them, let them feel good about their sins. Let them feel good about their filth. Let, let them feel good about it and just go right straight off into hell. You, you see, this shows me how these people have no God conscious. They 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 have no they have no God awareness. It does they, they never think about God. They don't incorporate God into their thoughts. They don't they don't say if I do this, how will God feel? How does God's word look at this my sin? Steve Quell sent me an article this morning. Trans faith takes over the church transgender pastors and renaming renaming ceremonies <laughs> yeah they're not talking about biblical answers they're talking about sin being the answer so they're going to rename and have what they call renaming ceremonies Oh, I can hear some of you now. But Pastor Langford, Jesus Christ, it is a message of compassion. It is a, a message of salvation. You're right. That's the disposition of the lamb. The lamb. But that won't be the disposition when the lamb turns into the lion and comes back riding the great white stallion, wielding that sword and crushing and ruling with a rod of iron. So now they're going to re having rename ceremonies. So you're a man, but you decided that you're a woman. What are you going to do? I'm I'm a man. My pronouns are he and him, but I want to be renamed she and her. Now, we all know preachers are not going to address these subjects. It's too upsetting to some. I'm going to address them because the Bible tells me to preach the word of God without compromise. I'm going to cry aloud. I'm not going to spare. I'm not going to be complicit. I'm not going to be impartial. And and and, and that's why Isaiah, he said to Isaiah 58, 1, spare not. In other words, nobody gets a pass. No, nobody gets a free ride. I watch that video. You've all seen the video of 
Joe Biden bragging about firing that prosecuting attorney in Ukraine and then using the phrase, they fired that SOB. He said, you will not get that billion dollars. And Donald Trump said nothing like that, but yet they say he, he did worse. <laughs> Quid pro quo. Latin, exchange for something. What in the world is happening to us? This nation is so divided, and I'm going to say this. These are the things that's going to lead to civil war, civil unrest in America. I mean, I got hammered because I talked about Donald Trump's pride. And the reason I addressed that subject was because God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. I want Donald Trump to have all the grace in the world and then some. That's what I want. So I'm, I'm, I'm cautionary in saying, sir, please be careful not to take God's name in vain like you've been doing. I got blasted for that. If I'll get blasted for encouraging, admonishing a man to embrace more humility, don't you think they won't pull swords and guns and go fight if they tried to defunct him and take him out of his office? Yes. There are people out there who are quote unquote patriots and they're going to do things you wouldn't imagine. And, and this is what will cause the government to rise up and to be more oppressive. I, I, I don't understand how a man says to his congregation, to his listeners, to his followers and say, I'm a God-called preacher. And then say, God didn't call me to preach against sin. God didn't call me to preach against those perversions. God just want me to make you feel good. I'll never forget the vision. God bless his heart. God bless his soul. He's gone on to be with the Lord, Burke Clendenden. He was an Assembly of God pastor out of Texas. I'll never forget the vision he had, and he shared it. I met Brother Clendenden in a camp meeting years and years ago, 35 years ago. But in this vision, he saw a man running through hell. And the man would reach down into the flames of the fire and pull people up by the nap of their neck and look at them and say, no, you're not the one, and throw them back in the fire and go a little further and reach down in the fire and pull another man up by the nap of the neck and look at him in the face and say, you're not the one. Throw him back in the fire and would go a little further and reach down and pull up another man by the nap of the neck and look in his face say you're not the one this went on for several minutes in this vision and Burke Clendenin said in his vision he said God what am I seeing what are you trying to show me he said that man is going through hell looking for the preacher that lied to him and he said the horror of realizing the influence that he has as a minister and preaching the gospel. He better preach the truth. Now let me ask you a question. I have no understanding of all the torments and punishments in hell. Neither do you. But I thought, if he could find that preacher that lied to him, what would he attempt to do to him? Now, of course, there is no literal physical body in hell, but they have all their five senses. If you don't believe that, go back and reread Luke chapter 15. The man demonstrates four of his five senses. The only one he did not demonstrate was smell. And I've heard other people who have been and visions and taken to hell say you can smell the stench. The rich man could hear. He could taste. Why? He wanted Lazarus to dip his finger in water and touch the tip of his tongue. He could see. 
Lazarus, afar off, in Abraham's bosom. All, all those senses were there. We just don't see in that story the sense of smell. But some of these people who have had these revelations, these visions, these experiences have said there, there's a stench there that you, you cannot fathom. So if this man could find this preacher, what do you think he would attempt to do? He would attempt to mar, mutilate, eviscerate him, which would be more punishment. Now, again, I don't know all the punishments. I don't know all of the torments. I don't know all of the vexations that men will experience in, in hell and in the lake of fire. I, I have no idea. I can't fathom them. I cannot grasp them. But I can tell you this. You don't want to go there. You don't want to go there. You want to keep your wedding garment spotless. You want to keep your robes washed in the blood of the Lamb that you might be found worthy to enter into God's eternal kingdom at the second advent of Christ our Lord. What will it be? Which will it be? Joshua said, choose you this day whom you shall serve, but as for me and my house, we shall serve the Lord. Let me say in closing today as I leave the air, repent. God is so merciful. God is so long-suffering. The Bible said in 2 Peter 3, 9, The Lord is not slack concerning his promises, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. All should come to repentance. Come to repentance. Romans 2, 4, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. He wants you to come. Come. Repent. If there's anything wrong in your life, right now, just take a moment and bow your head and say, Father, in the name of Jesus, forgive me of my sins. And if you know the sin, confess the sin. If we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The Voice of Evangelism with David Langford is brought to you by the faithful listeners and supporters throughout America. If you're looking for an uncompromising message, we invite you to tune in each week to The Voice of Evangelism. For more information, write to The Voice of Evangelism at P.O. Box 502, Kayser, North Carolina, 28020. That's P.O. Box 502, Kayser, North Carolina, 28020.